Okay. Hi everyone, this is Sarah with the Effect Book Club, and today we're going to have a very quick look at chapter 12, which is like two pages, and then start with chapter 13 on regression, which is super long. So we'll just start with that and then continue with it next week. And it's really mostly a recap, but the author just has a bit of a different way of looking at things. It's not so much like mathematically that you have to prove stuff but it's more about thinking about it what does this mean how can we apply it what does this mean in a causal way so I think it's still interesting to go through it um yeah so let's start with chapter 12 um so first he talks about methods that we'll be checking them out and he calls them a, a template um so thinking from the DAG perspective these are basically very similar DAGs that we can just apply to many different settings. So in the beginning of each of these templates or methods, we'll get a DAG and think about like what's the special thing here um, and then try to apply that. And regression is kind of the baseline for all of these things because we basically need it for everything um, and just tweak it a bit uh, for every one of these methods. And then the structure of those chapters after regression, so not this one, is first, how does it work? So generally, like, how do I, how do I think about this? What's, what's like the, the nice little hack that we're using for this? Um, then how is it performed, aka how do I type this into code? What do you need to think about? And then there's a whole section on how the pros do it, which the author himself says it's not exhaustive um, and it's mostly about like caveats and extensions that are common. But if you really want to use these methods, it makes a lot of sense to like actually check out the, the literature about it. Uh, or one other way to do this is to just find a paper that does exactly what you want to do and then copy it, which is also a way of how the pros do it. Mm -hmm. And that's all of chapter 12. Yeah. Any comments? Uh, uh, we could just say it's mission accomplished. We we got through whole chapter pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's yeah let's let's move on to chapter thirteen. Yeah, that's not going to be as quick. Um, no. I tried to write down some learning objectives. I'm pretty sure this list is going to grow. Um, yeah. So we'll try and review the basics of regression. I mean, we already had these in. At chapter four, right, in describing relationships, because a regression is one way of describing a relationship of two variables. Um, and then we'll check out non continuous variables and how we can incorporate those into, okay, it went with OLS, which is one way of a regression and it's the most common way of regression and it's a linear regression. And in this session, we're going to stay with the linear regression. So just put in OLS. But there's obviously other ways of doing regressions. Um, so how to incorporate non-continuous variables, but also non-linear relationships, which sounds a bit weird because, I mean, it's a linear um, thing, but, but there's ways of putting those in anyway. Just because we like OLS and it's easy to interpret, it's easy to work with. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get started. Um, this is mostly a recap from chapter four, I think. Um, and I, I kind of like this quote, I even like highlighted it, even though it's very basic, but um, just regression is the most common way in which we fit a line to explain variation. And I think this is the essence of this chapter. So it's, it's we use it most often, we fit a line, which is straight, and we want to explain variation with this. Um, and we can also use it for causal effects. So um, using a regression, we can actually close back doors. We think back to DAGs, we need to um, find all of the different paths that are back doors. And then we can just control for one of the variables on that path. And then we've closed that back door. Um, we can use the value of one variable X or whichever variable you want to call it to predict the values of another. 
But the important thing that like predicting does not mean anything causal there. It only starts being causal if we think about it, if we close the back doors, or if we use a template that automatically closes back doors. Yep. And one way to do a regression is to fit a line that describes the relationship. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. This is basically ordinary least squares. Um, mm -hmm. And the interpretation and why we like linear stuff so much is that the interpretation of the coefficient is just a slope. So it's going to be always the same no matter where we are on the slope. And that just makes it very easy to, to work with and to imagine what does this mean. Um, and then now that we have our coefficients, we can plug our values in, then we get a prediction. This prediction is called y hat, but it's not very often going to be like the actual y. There's always going to be some noise and we're almost never going to be able to predict something perfectly. It, I, I, I don't know if that's the point even. Um, but anyway, this difference between like our actual y and the predicted y is called the residual. And there's like a whole subsection on this later. Yeah. And then just as a side note, which I think we also already had in chapter four, is that we we do have a line with OLS, but we can make it curvy and like look different by adding polynomials. Right. And I, I think right, the, the main point is we wanna there's a, there's a causal relationship generally with one predictor, right? I guess it, it potentially it could be more than one, but you know, a lot of times you're interested in in the the slope of one predictor, and you want that to be a causal relationship. Um, and you, like you pointed out, it's that only is true if you're closing all these back doors. Um, that's why we're presumably including uh, these other covariates in our in our equation, right? Yeah, exactly. So just because we can predict something doesn't mean it's actually causal. Um, I don't know if it was in this book or somewhere else, but like if you take the grip strength like of a human, you can probably predict very well how long they can or how fast they can run a marathon. But like really it doesn't have to do anything with each other. Like how much you grip something doesn't really impact your marathon running abilities, but it just is, it, yeah. it's got this common underlying variable of just general right. fitness. Yep. Okay. So that's the basics. Now these are all the chapters, maybe sub chapters that we'll handle today. Um, so let's start and talk about error terms. Um, and this is something we, we just talked about, right? Because we said, so we have this prediction, which are these lines, um, and we have the actual points, which are like the actual outcomes. Um, and, and there's a difference between them. So our residual is when we take the OLS slope and we go from that to our actual outcome, that's residual. And then there's another way of saying this, which is called the error, which is when we go to the true model, which like we're trying to get there, but we never know if we're actually there. Um, that's when we go from the true model to the outcome, that's the error term. Um, so one is theoretical basically, and the other one is the actual thing that we have. Right, and we make the assumption, right, with OLS that the error terms, well, there's, there's a different assumptions, right? I think that they're, they don't vary with values of the covariate. It's, so it's it's homogenous, right? The error variance. And uh, generally we're assuming it's normally distributed as well. Yeah. At least in, in the base case of, of OLS, that's what we would assume. Yeah, there's the whole IID thing, right? Yeah, yeah, independent, identically distributed. Yeah. Um, the, the other interesting thing is like, we don't see the errors, right? But uh, we do see the residuals. Mm -hmm. um, and the other interesting thing is like re residuals are not uh, by definition uh, independent of one, one another because the residuals have to sum up to zero by the way the OLS oh, yeah. line is defined. Uh, so, th so 
I think that causes some issues sometimes, but usually we just ignore that. Um, but I don't know. I, <laughs> I've read multiple books on OLS and that's something that gets pointed out sometimes. Um, that, that the residual, the residual residuals that we observe are technically not independent of each other because of, because of the fact that they, mm -hmm. they do sum up to zero. That makes sense. Never thought okay. about that. And I'm guessing everybody's just happily ignoring that. Because yeah. They I, do I mean, if you, a lot of times, right, you're going to, if you're constructing a model, you're going to do some model diagnostics and usually those residuals, I mean, hopefully anyway, they, they look kind of random, <laughs> right? Across um, different levels of your predictor and um, it doesn't look like there's any clear pattern. I mean, that's what we want. And I think in a lot, a lot of cases that that would be true, even though we know that, yeah, the, the residuals are in fact correlated to a small degree. Then again, don't you always have like some sort of correlation as soon as you get like a large chunk of data, there's something, something's always going to be related to something. Um, yeah. yeah. And in, in my uh, field, also, like the, the normality assumption is not generally a good one. I, I know that just I don't want, want to sidetrack, but like we typically, if we're using a statistical model, it's going to be a GLM, mm -hmm. not OLS. So like a, a gamma, right, um, model or um, let me see, like inverse Gaussian, yeah, uh, things that have kind of that skewed air term as opposed mm -hmm. to the the bell shaped uh, error that we we use here. Yeah, that makes sense. I think in my field, they just always go for OLS. Also, like log it and prob it are sometimes used, but usually it's still just the OLS. And we, yeah, really. Yeah, like yeah. The what the, the, the uh, probe it or whatever. Like that's something I've never used. It's always like like, like certainly have used logistic regression, but not mm -hmm. the the probe it. I, I mean, I know they're basically generate similar results. Um, and I think that's more of an economics thing, right? The probit is is more common there. Really? Like usually I just see a linear probability model, which is an OLS using a binary as an outcome. Yeah. And I've been told that's fine. <laughs> and apparently it doesn't like generate that different outcomes. Like you still should probably check with the logic, but usually they just go with the OLS anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I know this is uh, further along in the chapter and I, I didn't read it yet, but, you know, I, I've read this at, from multiple sources that, right, uh, generally speaking, like the normal uh, standard errors of OLS are wrong. So at least in economics literature, you're always using these robust yeah. standard errors. Um, there are plenty of cases in my day to day work where I've used standard OLS. I, I, I do use it quite a bit. And I never think to use robust standard errors. Um, so uh, yeah, there's always somebody in the seminar who's like, hmm, on which level did you cluster your standard errors? Okay. Yeah. 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 So that's that I'm interested to hear about that part. I'm guessing we're not gonna go over that today, given how... not today, no, unfortunately. Yes. But I'm no, also excited fine. about that. Okay. okay. Um okay, so let's get back to the residuals. Um and the author makes a point to point out wow, um, that it doesn't like the error terms or our residuals, they contain everything that causes Y, which is not included in our model. So for example, if we have, if this is the actual DAG of our relationship and we have this model, okay, that doesn't look right anyway, but we only incorporate basically X on Y then we have the effect of Z, A, B, and C still in there in this era, in this era term, right? Um, and so yeah. for Z, A, and B, that that's not good. But for C, we couldn't care less. So like really, we don't need to explain as much as if we wanted to predict something when we're in causal inference. So maybe the C explains, I don't know, 70% of the variation, but we just don't care because that's not the part of a relationship that we look at. So there's going to be yeah. also stress later on, but like the R squared just doesn't matter as much to us when we're in the causal stuff. Yeah, I think the point here 
goes back to that earlier chapter about identification. You're always going to be worried about those uh, uh, variables that influence both, I, I guess, to use the term treatment, even though that's not necessarily a, a good way to describe what we're looking at. But that, that right, but like the x variable, right? Things that cause both the x and the y, so the independent and the and the and the de dependent variable. And so, yeah. So in this case, a, b, and z are um, influencing bo both of those. Therefore, we have to control for them in a regression or else we, we don't have a causal relationship between X and Y. But because, as you point out, like C only influences Y, it doesn't influence for that. So we, we don't have to control for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just I just thought that that part was really useful to be like, okay, the error term catches everything that we haven't included, and that might be some random noise, but then might also be like relevant variables, or it might be variables that are not relevant. Yeah, it's kind of helpful to to think about it. I was yeah, that was an interesting uh, section of the text because uh, I think normally we just hand wave things and and just say, well, that really, you know, these other causes are are things that we'll never be able to uh, measure. And, you know, we can really just treat it all as like random noise, right? Or, or it's almost like it isn't really a cause. There's just noise. <laughs> um, but that's not necessarily true. In reality, there there are all kinds of uh, causes out there, right? And we, we just kind of, well, just kind of ignore it <laughs> most of the yeah. time. Um, yeah, so... I don't know. It just, it was an interesting passage, right? Because in reality, it's its not just noise. There are reasons behind why, um, you know, we, we, we got the values that we got. There are causes that we're just not capturing because we have a, yeah. a, a model that's um, an oversimplification of reality. Yeah, because it's a model, right? Like, that's... Yeah, that's exactly. So we just talked about some assumptions. And I think one of them was also exogeneity. Um, so I also thought this was interesting because he uses a lot of different words for the same assumption and they keep on popping up in seminars for me. So that was just, yeah, interesting. So basically this assumption is that the variables in the model or just the variable that we care about. And like, if we include a variable as a control, we don't care about what it does. We just want to close the back door. So maybe it's just about our treatment variable that this should be uncorrelated with the error term. And what that basically means is that there's no, no relationship with the error term. There's no backdoor that we've missed. There's no, there's no path that's left over to the, uh, to the error term. Um, so if something is still in the error term and that is correlated with X, then we haven't closed this path, then we have a problem. Um, and the, the other way to say this is that X is correlated with the error term, and so it's endogenous. Um, and then this is called an indigeneity problem where we get a bias because um, we have omitted a variable, and that thing is called the omitted variable bias. So I think these terms just pop up a lot, like omitted variable bias, endogeneity, correlation, and this exogeneity assumption, and they're basically all the same thing. Yeah. Now, um, I, I read the ch chapter, early portions of the chapter over the weekend. So it's been a few days. I'm, I'm a little hazy on, on the details, but like, don't we have issues uh, actually determining if the variable is correlated with the error term? Because we don't see the error term, we see the residual. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing that I thought was interesting. Uh... This is like way later, but yeah, and I I actually didn't yeah get this far uh, for sure. I mean, this is like way later on polynomials, yeah. but I thought this was interesting. So basically, you plot the residual against the variable that you're interested in, and like in yeah. this graph, you can still see that there's a relationship between x and the residual. So you're like, okay, I'm yeah. gonna add a square term because this looks like an inverse U shape, and then you do that, and then the residuals don't have a, a shape uh, that you can identify anymore. So this is the only thing I found about this in the chapter. Um, but I thought that was very clever to like take the residuals and see if we can still find a relationship. And if there is, then 
we should do something about it. I think they so, also do this in the IV literature, or if they have like yeah. a binary um, um, instrument hmm. that they then try to see if the residuals are the same on both of those zero and ones. Um, yeah, that's the only way I know. So, okay, so standard procedure would say that you should uh, do kind of a diagnostic check uh, to, to see if the exogeneity assumption is satisfied by looking at uh, the variable itself with, with the residual. So the, or I guess the residual plotted against the, the variable itself. And yeah, if you, uh, if you uh, want it right. to be causal, then yes, I think. Yeah. All right. I think this was also in the, in the chapter on like um, using tags where, where you were trying to, although this is a bit different, you know, never mind. I didn't say that. <laughs> Okay, so that's our error terms. No, yeah. wait. Honestly, it started out the this sub chapter and it called itself regression assumptions, but then really there was only one assumption that came up. I think later in this chapter, there's going to be more assumptions and then strategies on how to deal with these assumptions not being met. But I think that's going to be next week. Um. Then the next thing is about sampling variation, because every time that we have our data set, that's like, it's almost never going to be the entire population. So we always have the sampling variation where it's always going to be a bit different what we're getting out of there. And our regression coefficients, just like the mean, which we talked about very early in this book club, they, they're supposed to follow a normal distribution. So if we sample a lot of times and then we, we estimate this uh, coefficient, the, the estimates of this coefficient should follow a normal distribution. Um, and the sampling distribution is this like square root of sigma squared over the variance times n. So there's only three things we can change to like influence the, the precision of our, um, of our estimates. And that's, the three variables that are in this in this term. So we could shrink the standard deviation of the error term by, for example, including more variables that we know will very well predict the, the variable of uh, our outcome variable. So um, going back to this one, we could decide to include C to increase the prediction power of our model. Um, to, to decrease uh, the standard deviation. We could try to pick an X that varies a lot because if it's not just two values that we have, then then just, just more points from which we can infer anything. Or we could try to increase N. So those are kind of like the three things we can do to increase precision. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, yeah, I'd never thought about it this way, but I thought that was... I mean, a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I think the larger sample size is probably the thing that comes comes to mind. Uh, but yeah, the, the the fact that the standard error actually, um, when you have uh, a variable that varies a lot, right, is is, is interesting, and and maybe not so obvious. Yeah, and, and I feel like that would make it easier to sell something, right? To be like, ah, oh, okay, have a look at this distribution of my treatment variable. Here you can see that, I don't know, in space and in time and whatever, it actually does vary a lot. So this should mean that my precision is not too bad. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's something you can really do ex post. Um, and then this, um, this including a variable to to increase the prediction power. I think that part is very interesting um, because of course you have to make sure that you don't pick a collider by accident and then open again back doors. Um, but yeah, this goes against the whole mantra of like, let's not include too many controls, um, but rather like, okay, might make sense to do that. Then there's a whole thing about hypothesis testing, which I think all of us have done a lot. So I'll just go over this very quickly. But I think the most interesting thing was that 
the author strongly dislikes hypothesis testing um, and strongly dislikes p-values and, and cutoffs because he says that the choice of the rejection values or alpha level is absolutely arbitrary and it's very sharp. So if we put those stars onto a table and then we're like, oh, okay, there's no stars, it's not significant, but really it's like the p-value is like 0 0.11 or so, like why wouldn't that be significant anymore? Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind, but it's also not really, I mean, just kind of how we do stuff to, to choose an alpha value and then alpha level and then go with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this makes me think, it writes the whole uh, Bayesian versus frequentist debate. And obviously in the Bayesian world, you can move away from, from p-values. And um, I brought this up in the past that I, I haven't read the full book, but like statistical rethinking is it for our folks and um uh he does cover i mean a lot of it is it's regression right and he talks about dags and how to do some of this stuff um with without the the normal frequentist framework of you know uh use or uh, uh you know the normal frequentist way of, of kind of rejecting the null hypothesis mm -hmm. that's interesting Okay, so just to go over this really quickly, how do we do like something like a hypothesis test? We pick a theoretical distribution, we estimate our beta, then we use that theoretical distribution to see how unlikely it would be to get our value. And if it's super unlikely, our initial value is probably wrong. Like that's, that's basically how it works. Um, and a way to like streamline this and not have four steps, but basically only one is hypothesis testing where you first pick a null hypothesis. And usually this is that our value is equal to zero. Like sometimes it's not, but like 90%, 99% of the time it, it actually is. Um, the only thing I could think of was like a, a difference in means where, but then again, like there you're testing that the difference in means is not zero. So then you're at zero again. So yeah, like, I mean, I feel like that's what software does by default. I don't even know if you can change it. I've never tried to. I mean, right? I mean, that's that's when you when you're running the output of a linear model, like for instance, an R, right? It that's what it's testing. Yeah. I, and I all don't... of like the if you think about the Kolmogorov Smirnov test or something like that. I don't know these diagnostic tests. They're also with the null hypothesis, which is like something with zero. Yeah. And then theoretically, you're supposed to pick a rejection value or a rejection level alpha before you actually check their probability, which in reality, that's not really what you're doing because I don't know, if you look at a regression table, you're not before like, okay, so my um, rejection level alpha is gonna be 0.95 and then I'm only gonna check it out if it's two stars or or something like that. It's not, it's not really how it works. It's mostly done, but this is like, <laughs> yeah. hypothetically, this is how you should be doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, we all kind of <laughs> uh, fall into those traps, right? Uh, you, you don't necessarily <laughs> um, say, I'm going to, I'm going to hold to this uh, alpha value necessarily. It's kind of like, well, I'm going to look at what. <laughs> <laughs> what the results say first and then kind of make a decision about what I'm going to do next or how I'm going to interpret this. Yeah. Exactly. So, so then we have this, uh, we've seen these graphs a lot of times, but this is basically um, a two-sided test with, oh, it's 0.142. This is 10%, I'm guessing. Anyway, um, so you try to be in this gray shaded area, and if you are, then you re you reject the null hypothesis, and that's, that's basically it. And then there's two types of errors you can have with it, and the author's like, yeah, it doesn't make sense to call them type one and type two because you never know which one's which. And I think that makes I think it makes a 
valid point because I'm always confused which one, which one is which because type one just doesn't have it in the name. So the type one error rate is that false positive rate. So it's you reject something, but it's true. Like you shouldn't be rejecting it. And then the type two error rate is you're not rejecting something, but but you should be rejecting it. Um, and then a different way to think about this is to just use a p-value. So not do a hypothesis test, but basically you just double the percentile because it's a two-sided test. Um, and then you have a p-value and then you attach the rest of it. Um, or you could go with a t-statistic um, where it's, it's more standardized. So you know if this t-statistic is over or below, over an absolute value of 1.96, then it's probably significant. I really like this. It was like, write this down and repeat it as a mantra whenever you do something with regressions. Um, an estimate that's not statistically significant doesn't mean that it's wrong. And you should not necessarily change your results to get something significant. So like, this is the whole point, right? You, you have your hypothesis and then you test it and then you're done. And the point is not to be like, oh, this is not significant. So I'm going to go change something about it because then you go in the direction of overfitting. Well, isn't, isn't the problem here about getting published, right? Like yes. if you've yes. spent all this time on this research and you don't find a statistically significant result, you're much less likely to get published. And that's... Yeah. Yeah. That's what's driving this uh, issue. Yeah, totally. Like, yes, <laughs> I think it's really yeah. hard to, unless you have something where it's super well established that there's always a relationship between it and then you don't find a relationship, then you might be able to do that. Yeah. But then probably people are just going to be like, oh, but that's just your sample or yeah. Right. And I think there's advice out there that like you really should start, you should think about the statistical power of what you're doing ahead of time so that if there really is an effect, what's the the probability that I'm actually going to detect it? You know, there's, I'm not like an expert in that, but I know that's kind of where people are headed. Like, hey, before you even do spend all your time on the research, like, let's think about this. Like, are you, <laughs> what's, what, you know, sensitivity test this, what's, what, what's the likelihood that I'm, I'm going to, going to actually detect an effect given that it does exist. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us are coming in, having done studies where there are many possible um, in input variables, and you might have seen the XKCD comic. You do a bunch of tests, and it turns out that green jelly beans cause cancer. And yeah. um, hopefully, by studying a book like this, we'll be able to go through all those variables and and better discuss what significance means. Okay. There's also the problem with like multiple comparisons. And I think we were kind of getting to that earlier where you're supposed to pick your uh, alpha value ahead of time. If, if you're, if you're doing multiple um, statistical significance time, like you're more likely to have a, a false positive, right? Um, Cause you know, that, that, you know, 0 0.05 threshold that we all use means, you know, one, there's a one in 20 chance that we're going to have a false positive. But if you're doing all these, different comparisons at once um you know you're you're likely to pick up just random noise and, and call that um statistically significant and um a lot of stuff around there to correct for there's like a bonferrani um mm -hmm. correction out there to to try to adjust for that problem um yeah but but uh yeah there are, are certainly um challenges that i think we <laughs> Um, we all face there. Like we kind of cheat with the data. And I think about just machine learning problems in general, like generally you have like a validation set that you're looking at and you're fitting multiple models and seeing how that performs on the same validation set. Like you're also likely to fit to the noise, right? Like, so you want to keep the number of models that you're testing against the validation set um, relatively low. So you don't run into that issue. Um Right, because if you you test enough models, you eventually will probably run into one that's going to fit really well. Um, that doesn't necessarily generalize well. Yeah, I kind of like that in the machine learning world that you have this validation set 
where you're like, okay, now I've done all of my overfitting, let's see if this still holds. Um, whereas in social sciences, you don't really have that. You just have your data and then mm -hmm. you never know, is this person P-level hacking or yeah. did they just like torture the data until it's like, okay, here, here's one significant relationship. Or is this just the first time they went to the data and then they like instantly found it? You just don't know. I mean, that's probably also the point of all of the robustness checks, but they're probably also only going to show robustness checks that hold up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, then you said a significance test isn't the last word on a result. So if it's positive, but doesn't, or like if something seems like it's significant, doesn't necessarily mean that like you should take it into account. And significant doesn't mean meaningful. So if your coefficient is like 0.0000001, then it might be significant, but honestly, it's not gonna mean anything in the world. Like, sure it increases by a tiny fraction, but we just, we just don't care enough. Right. Right. You can always achieve statistical significance at some point by, you know, if you've reached that critical mass in terms of sample size. Yeah. A simple example I've seen in the education world as I saw a seminar where someone was talking about their correlational studies. And it turns out almost every single one of their correlations reached the so-called significance according to the software. But of course, as people in this group knows, that simply means that your correlation is not exactly zero. Yeah. Yeah. Like if everything is significant, <laughs> there's got to be something wrong. <laughs> okay. The next thing is about regression tables and how to read them. Um, yeah, each column represents one regression. We usually have um, standard errors in the parentheses. Sometimes it's t-statistics. The author has like a whole um, thing on how to determine whether it's t-statistics or standard errors. But usually it should just tell you. Um, then we have the significant stars, um, which again, the author isn't a fan. And then below we have a couple of measures of the model quality. Um, Usually it's like an R squared, maybe an F statistic. I don't often see the root mean square error. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I mean, the, the R squared, right, is, is kind of universally understood uh, yeah. because it's between zero and one, uh, at least if you're kind of doing it on the training data, uh, that that's the case. Um, whereas root mean squared error, like what's good and what's bad only is relevant if you're comparing multiple models. Just looking at mm -hmm. that value alone doesn't really necessarily give you a, a a a good indication, right? Other than it's kind of similar to a standard deviation. So, like, if you know what your mean is, I guess you can kind of compare it to that mm -hmm. and decide yes, whether root, that's root mean squared tends to come up in the machine learning books uh, mm -hmm. because R squared seems like an abstraction. Talk about things like explain variance where like you were just saying, root mean squared has the same units as what you were measuring in the first place. So it might be mm. useful to interpret that way. Yeah, um, of course, I, I mean, I'm sure Sarah, you run into this problem in economics. I, I run it into the into this problem with uh, insurance, but like uh, the, the emphasis isn't always on R squared, right? Cause well, you're, you're probably more interested in causal inference. A lot of times I'm only interested in prediction, but um, nevertheless, like the R squared values are never gonna be like, really that high <laughs> like sometimes a 30... they are though if you okay. have two week fixed effects they're super high but it doesn't mean okay. anything uh, gotcha uh you know for for me like if i'm trying to understand like healthcare costs based on um like diagnoses and age and gender and things like that like you know if you're trying to see kind of where you're at today in terms of like mor morbidity and try to figure out what your costs are next year um, like an R squared, a good R squared might be, and using just an OLS type model might be like 20 to 30%. That's pretty good. Um, it, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't know if you're comparing to like physical science, it's, yeah. it's really, really bad. But it's um, like, I don't know, it's just a different thing, right? There's just so much more impacting everything. Right. You just don't get, um, you know, all of those variables that impact costs, it, you know, yeah. uh, so, so you're never going to get really high uh, yeah. R squareds. But it's good enough 
Yeah. Good enough to be useful. Yeah. Um, and it, I've always seen this R squared adjusted and I never knew what it adjusted for. So I just thought that was interesting for me and um, that it considers the number of variables just because it inflates automatically. If you add a variable, the R squared just mechanically is going to go up and the adjusted one takes care of that. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if they talked about it here, but like AIC and BIC are also sometimes reported with these, yeah. which are kind of doing the same thing, right? Um, uh, those use a likelihood function, uh, but then penalize also for uh, the number of predictors. Yeah. Yeah. And then those are also um, measures that only make sense if you compare them across a couple of different um, a couple of different models. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I like this quote. So he was like, okay, so what do we do with these measures? Take a quick look, but don't be too concerned. Um, especially about the R squared, as we said, it just really differs from discipline to discipline, how high it's gonna be. Um, and especially in the in the causal inference world, like the R squared is of little importance if we're super sure that if we included everything that we need to include. But um, I think you talked about this earlier, yeah. like including, if if you do have this variable that you don't necessarily have to control for, <laughs> but it really improves the model fit, you still might want to do that. Yeah. And I think that was what what that variable y and the the dag we looked at earlier. Yeah, that was the not y. I'm sorry. It was um no. was it c, c or something? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it just depends, right? But like, for example, if C then I don't know is somehow connected to something that might then become a collider then it might still make sense to not include it. Um, yeah, I think it really depends. And yeah. Okay, and then I thought this this part was interesting as well because I'm always a bit confused about controls and how to interpret stuff. And so the basic idea is that we include a control, for example, for the year. So we remove the part that is explained by year and then we can just, pretend that everything that we're doing is just looking at the same year. So we're just comparing things that are with the, within the same year. So this, this um, um, table is about inspections and the number of applications and the year of inspection. So here we're just like comparing everything within 2015 with each other and not with 2016. And then we go to 2016 and so on. And I thought that was kind of helpful. With a, something like the year, it's yeah. easy to um, to imagine that because there's very dis, like they're just discrete. There's only five years or so, but if it's a continuous control variable, it's got, it gets a bit more messy. I can't remember in this example. Is that is that a dummy variable or is it like um... no? So this is actually 2015 to I don't know 20 or so. So, so that assumes a linear relationship between year and the the effect here? Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So that I guess that's the one thing you got to be careful with, right? Because that may or may not be true. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a super short one on subscripts. And it, it mostly focuses on I. Um, and it's usually individual. So like a country or a person or a firm or whatever. And the author just mostly ignores that because it makes things look more complicated, but it's just the index, the data varies across. Okay, and so now to the part where we get from the first part of the book to the second part of the book that we've all been waiting for. Okay, so this graph is actually too large for my for my screen. <laughs> so sorry about that. But so we're, we're trying to go from a DAG to making it, it a regression um, equation. And so he's just got this flow chart where we can where we can figure out where should we put it in this in this regression. Um, and I think this da, 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 da. wait oh yeah so I think this part was was what we were talking about earlier maybe add a as a predictor to reduce residual variance and thus standard errors. Um, so it's. It's a very long path to get here. Um, 
So I don't think it's a lot of variables that we should actually include, um, but if we do, we can check it out in the graph. Okay. I don't have that much time left. I'll just try yeah. and go through this, but you know. Yeah, we, um, and I do have a hard stop uh, when, when the hour is up, but um, I'm just curious, uh, Sarah, what your thoughts are right now in terms of like, are we gonna, should we add an extra week? I mean, I know we can figure this out next week, but like this, to your point earlier, like this is like a hundred page chapter. Um, do you think we'll probably need three weeks for this? It's a good question. Let me, um, I, I got through half of it and I don't know. Okay, I'm just gonna, so basically I, we're just start. So we only got through the basics now. Right. Yep. So getting exactly. fancier with regression should be rather quick because it's mostly about like binary variables and like interactions and whatnot. But then yeah. it depends if we want to take time for this, but I think it yeah. might make sense to check it out more in depth. What do you guys yeah. think? I, I mean, I, I was just curious, uh, just wanted to take a pulse on, on where we're at with that. I, I'm fine if we want to spread it out. I know some other book clubs sometimes say, well, let's take the discussion offline, put it in the Slack or something, but or just keep moving on. But I, I do think this is like, obviously, regression is a huge component of causal analysis. So I'm, I'm fine taking our time on it. Um, and I, I think the discussion has been good today. Uh, obviously, I yeah. could have just remained silent and we probably would have <laughs> been done already but but like that's the point right just to to have a have a good discussion here so um yeah um yeah, maybe I don't know we can ask on saying. slack and just tell people that we've yeah it, it might take more time and ask but yeah. also my preference would be to go through all of it yeah um, because none of this is really new right like kind of all of it i've seen at some point of time but yes. it's just very yeah. helpful to go through it and think about it once more yeah I agree with you all. That section, your standard errors, is really interesting, especially if you haven't seen it before. I thought it was a great discussion. And then if you're concerned about the back end, some of those last chapters look especially short, and we might be able to get through those pretty quickly to finish this book club before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, and just so you know, I, I signed up for the matching component. Um, uh, and I, I think that will at least take two weeks as well. But mm -hmm. um, if at any point, Sarah, like you need some help, like if we do this over three weeks, um, just let us know because it's obviously a lot to present like three weeks in a row. Yeah. I mean, at least I get to read all of it. That's something. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do. Okay. okay. So then let's just stop here because I think we've only got like five minutes left and I don't think it makes sense. Yeah to like try and get into all of this. Plus it's all like one sub chapter. So maybe okay. let's just try to push that to next week. Okay, I'll hit stop on the... <laughs>